So hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us today in our UN Behavioral Science Week session on the global support for the application of behavioral science. So this session came out of some conversations we had with UN colleagues across the UN speaking about we often talk about UN efforts for behavioral science in, in terms of behavioral science application. We don't often really speak in terms of the, the global and the amount of support that already exists outside the UN. So that's essentially the point of this webinar to speak to what's going on outside and how we can leverage and learn from that with the, inside the UN system. So for those of you who haven't come across any of the webinars before, my name is Mary McLennan. I'm the Senior Advisor on Behavioral Science to the Executive Office of the Secretary General. I also lead an initiative called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which I will speak to shortly. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are still in UN Behavioral Science Week. Uh, this week brings together 26 UN entities, so it's quite a big effort uh, undertaking across many, many colleagues uh, uh, across the entire UN, across a lot of the UN, excuse me. So there are 17 sessions over these five days, and although we are on the fourth day of the five days, uh, all of the sessions will be recorded. So we'll have them on the YouTube playlist that you can access um, if you want to check out ones that have already happened on health, climate, gender, peace and security, and many other areas. But tomorrow we have sessions on migration as well as information sharing and an advanced session about the value add and criticisms of behavioral science application in the UN. So I um, encourage you to check, check those out tomorrow if you can. Okay, so as I mentioned, I lead the UN Behavioral Science Group. This is an initiative of the UN Innovation Network, and it brings together over a thousand UN colleagues from more than 60 entities and 110 countries. So it's quite a diverse group on different dimensions from obviously the different contexts through, the, through to the domains of health, climate, gender, peace and security, as I alluded to earlier, but also regarding colleagues' experience with behavioral science. So although we have some colleagues who are behavioral scientists in the UN, most are at the early stages of their journey, really exploring how to apply behavioral science in one project or two projects and um, in the early days of their work. But no matter where you are along that spectrum, there's a place in the behavioral science group for you. You can also join the behavioral science group if you are outside the UN as an observer, and um, we'll include the link in the chat shortly for you to, to, to join the group, whether you're in the UN or outside. Um, as well as to the agenda of UN Behavioral Science Week, if you haven't seen it already. Also to note, um, Secretary General and various other senior levels of the UN have signified strong support for the application of behavioral science. This is just one statement from the Secretary General, which calls it a critical tool to, um, for, for the UN to progress on its mandate, and also strongly encourages the investment of behavioral science in, into behavioral science across the UN. And some of the colleagues with us today on the call have played an instrumental role in some of the efforts to, to um, to garner the support from the Secretary General. Okay, so that's a bit of a summary with respect to behavioral science across the UN. You can check out a number of the documents that have been released, including this guidance note from the Secretary General, which covers um, in more detail that vision. Also the UN Behavioral Science Report, which speaks to the 25, um, excuse me, the experiences of 25 UN entities, and then also a guide that was released relatively recently. You can join the group as well as follow us on Twitter if you'd like. Okay. So enough about that, now on to the content of today's webinar. So um, how we're just going to go is we'll have a, some opening remarks from our first speaker and then a panel discussion. So we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Even if you don't have a question yourself, it'd be great if you could look at the questions to upvote those of your colleagues to ensure that we have um, a discussion that's really based on, on what is meaningful to the audience with us today. So keep, keep an eye out in the Q&A box as we go. Okay, so now on to our first speaker. I'm very happy to announce uh, someone who probably needs little introduction to many of you with us, especially those in the UN, Professor Cass Sunstein. He's a Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard. Uh, he's been instrumental in a number of not only academic fields, applications of behavioral science, but also in practice. He's been an advisor to us for a number of years, particularly when it comes to some of the work with the Secretary General and other spaces, but also uh, to organizations like the World Bank, European Commission, WHO, and others. He's also been the um, worked in the Obama administration in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, where he was the administrator. Cass has also prolifically, prolifically published, uh, both in terms of the academic literature, but also in terms of books. So if you haven't checked out one of his books, just a few to maybe draw your attention to is, is Nudge, which really kicked off a lot of the work in terms of applied behavioral science, and also Sludge, which was recently released and highlights a number of the key themes that we we're talking about in terms of administrative burden and behavioral barriers within the UN. So with that, um, Cass, over to you. Okay, thank you, Mary, and thanks, everyone. It's 
an inspiration and a thrill to see all of the work being done at the UN, uh, informed by behavioral science, and uh, to know that there are people one will never meet whose lives are being improved and maybe saved as a result. So I thought what I do in these remarks is say something about the past, something about the present, and something about the future of behavioral science in public policy. So if there were an origin story that was the basis for a Marvel Comics movie, it would actually have a scene involving social scientists, believe it or not, who were in pitch battle with one another about uh, the human species. And the pitch battle included, on the one hand, superheroes with superpowers who emphasized human rationality and how we run numbers, maybe quickly, but pretty well, in deciding what to do about risks or about equality or about escaping poverty. And on the other side were the mildly stronger superheroes who were saying that human beings are rational enough, but they depart in systematic ways from uh, perfect rationality. This is not looking like a promising movie. Uh, we need very good Hollywood writers to make it work. But there was drama, a lot of drama in the early uh, days and years. Uh, the origin story culminates with a set of findings about our species, which have now produced a set of Nobel Prizes and which are the foundation for much of modern applied behavioral science. We know that human beings, for example, uh, focus on the short term, not the long term, that today and tomorrow really matter. They're in bold font and vivid colors. Uh, the future, not so much. And for governments, that can create problems for organizations too, and certainly for individuals for whom long-term economic and health outcomes are uh, basically clouded in fog and tomorrow tomorrow's joy and maybe tomorrow's expenditure and risk taking are very vivid and that can lead to long-term harm. We know also that human beings tend to be unrealistically optimistic. That's kind of a good thing. If you're running from a tiger, you ought to think I can run really fast, maybe faster than a tiger, not I'm about to get eaten. But unrealistic optimism for nations, for organizations, for nonprofits, and certainly for individuals uh, facing, let's say, desperation or deprivation, unrealistic optimism can create a failure to take precautions. It's a problem. We know that the status quo has a magnet associated with it. It's a little bit of a seducer. And that means that inertia is a really powerful force, which means that changing at an organization or an individual life in a way that can make things much better is often uh, unwelcome, even though the circumstances suggest it ought to be done. So a picture is emerging of a present biased unrealistically optimistic and occasionally status quo bound creature that is humanity who also suffers from, and this is the fourth on the list, uh, limited attention. So the number of things we attend to is a small subset of the number of things that we should attend to. And that's because our cognitive resources are limited and that can create problems again for policymakers for individuals and for organizations of all kinds. Now that's the past, the development of a theory of humanity about which we know more than at any time in human history. And while it's still in development, the working pieces for purposes of policy are uh, pretty much in place. In terms of the present, what we've seen all over the world in North America, which is the part of the world I know best, as you may have detected from this barbaric accent, it is an American accent, big time, I'm acutely aware of that. Um, what we've seen is behaviorally informed policy, which is responsive to these findings. Uh, these responses take two fundamental forms. One, let's call it educative, and the other, let's call it architectural. And the architectural forms might be, for example, a policy that makes it really easy for people to be benefiting from a program that can turn their lives around. 
the extreme case of ease is people are automatically in. So children don't even have to sign up maybe for our free school meals, they're automatically in. And some countries have done that, resulting in millions, and in some cases, many millions of children enjoying a benefit to which they are legally entitled and which they might not otherwise get. President Biden has issued an executive order on customer service. That's a little bit of a, a mild phrase. It's really about improving government performance across the board, and it is behaviorally informed, and it applies to the Department of Agriculture. It applies to the Department of Homeland Security, the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, the Social Security Administration, basically every part of the government is asked to simplify things, change the architecture so that people can enjoy benefits. Um, educative interventions include such things as calorie labels so that can, people can make informed choices about what to eat, a greenhouse gas inventory of the sort that many nations now have, which in some nations has just by virtue of its existence, driven down the uh, volume of greenhouse gas emissions, and reminders where people get on their cell phone, uh, a reminder that there's a doctor's appointment due, that there's a legal requirement that they haven't satisfied yet, uh, that there's something they ought to know, a warning, for example, about something that's going wrong in their life that they can fix in a hurry, maybe just through one click, it might involve payment, it may involve a change of a habit. We know that these behaviorally informed policies, or at least an assortment of them, are doing spectacularly well in improving life outcomes, sometimes by changing the architecture against which decisions are made, and sometimes by increasing people's capacity for agency by telling them something that they might not otherwise know or that they might not otherwise attend to. And if I've been uh, a little more articulate than I fear I've been, uh, it should be clear that each of the architectural or educative interventions, behaviorally formed, is responsive to one or more of the features of human beings that can create trouble for us. They might counteract inertia. Automatic enrollment does that. They might counteract unrealistic optimism. A warning can do that. They might counteract limited attention as by making salient, for example, through a reminder, things that might otherwise not be attended to. Okay, that's the present. And we have uh, a universe of interventions all over the world, um, which in enough cases are working spectacularly well to give us a sense of uh, hope for future developments. Speaking of which, the future, there are two categories of things that are not here quite, but are about to explode. The first involves, and this won't surprise you, AI, and the second involves scarcity. I wanna say something about frontiers with respect to AI and scarcity. There's a lot to say about AI, and I'm gonna say just one thing which is AI is often working by building on a model of human be beings that preceded the explosion of work, which was the opening remarks that you've been kind enough to listen to. To be a little clearer, AI is typically working by seeing what do people choose? Do they choose this or that? If they choose this, then we're going to feed them a lot of this. If they click on that, then gosh, are they going to see a lot of that. If their prompts, and this is something coming, suggest an interest in this or a set of beliefs of this kind, then we're going to flood the user, the prompter, with that. Now, that's a model that disregards people's present bias. In fact, it exploits people's present bias. It disregards people's inertia. In fact, it exploits people's inertia. It doesn't counteract their optimism. It plays to their optimism. An imperative for the future of behaviorally informed, let's say, engagement with AI is to use the model of humanity, which is informing present policymaking all over the world, rather than the model of humanity that was repudiated 
roundly in roughly 1977. So that's a challenge for AI. With respect to scarcity, the basic point is that people all over the world, this is built into our species, have limited cognitive resources. We're like really good computers, and there's a lot of processing going on all the time. If we are old, if we are sick, if we are poor, if we are scared, if we suffer from a mental health problem of one or another kind, if we are young and struggling with what youth sometimes entails, then the problem of limited bandwidth jumps. Sometimes it jumps exponentially. That suggests that the uh, goal of reducing burdens in processes, something which is a problem in institutions all over the world, including my government and including the United Nations itself, the goal of reducing the sludge or complexity of the process is an imperative. For development, often it takes far too long for the people who are supposed to benefit from the thing to get the thing. They might have to fill out paperwork, which they can't fathom. They might have to deal with waiting time, and they don't really have a lot of waiting time. The future of scarcity and its uh, reflection of an understanding of it in policy involves one thing, just one thing, which is the reduction of a form of tax that doesn't have money associated with it, but is let's call it the cruelest tax of all. It's the time tax in policy making and elsewhere. Let's shall we for the future uh, drive time taxes way, way down. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that quick tour of a lot of behavioral science concepts, history, and, and where we're going in the future, or potentially going in the future. Okay, so there are a few questions coming in for you. So let me ask you, but to them, send them to you now, Kaz. Um, so I'll just I'll I'll ask all of them, and you can respond as you um, as you'd like. So um, how would you deal with government entities or the UN, let's say, that have a low interest or capacity for interventions that require um, behavioral science? How would you um, how would you maybe engage with uh, governments and internationalizations with that kind of background or that standpoint? Um, and you mentioned a bit of AI, so maybe just broadly data was a question around there's AI, but there's also data, how behavioral science could perhaps be applied with that. Um, and then if there's one area where international organizations should apply behavioral science, what would you suggest there? So I'll, I'll stop there. So an area kind of what, how do you interface or engage with governments and international organizations and then um, data more broadly? How does that relate to the comments about AI and other things you mentioned? Okay, yeah, that's great. So the one area I would focus on, um, though there are lots of uh, good answers, is poverty reduction. And the reason is that Poverty often entails desperation and sometimes a uh, short life. It's cruel and to eliminate that would be kind. So, and maybe an entitlement also. So let's do that. And many of the good programs for, that are behavioral informed have uh, uh, tackled poverty and eliminating it. That's very challenging, but making it less or less uh, damaging, that's that's very doable. That's doable in the next month, a little better than we've done. So that's, that's that. Uh, in terms of AI, um, the opportunity of AI is to uh, interact with and acquire and use data. So the data point is to foundational to everything Mary and others have done. So to see use of behavioral science or behavioral insights and data as part of the same program, that's, that's a really good idea. We can't know what will work without acquiring data. We might have enough understanding to think this is probably gonna work, uh, but to acquire data to see if it's working, that's essential. And that's in some ways the holy grail of behaviorally informed work. Uh, and remind me of the third point, which I loved. I'm not quite sure. I'm this question. Uh, if I'm interpreting it correctly, mm -hmm. which is maybe my my problem, not not the questioner's problem. Um, so it's about how governments um, can can apply behavioral science if they're maybe not interested. But also, I think it might be a point about 
engagement with citizens? I'm, I'm not sure, but how, how you engage with um, governments who maybe aren't as interested in behavioral science, what would you say to them and how would you promote it overall? So don't we all find that if people think a tool is useful for solving a problem that they're very concerned with, they want that tool. So if people have a broken piece of wood, a hammer and a nail might be really attractive. Uh, if people find their grass is growing and they don't know what to do, a lawnmower is a, a great idea. And I think of behavioral science with governments is exactly that. When I went to the White House under President Obama, if I just talked about it abstractly about behavioral science, I don't think people would have been very uh, friendly toward me. They would have thought you're in a world. It's not our world. But if you talk about uh, how health and health care, or about air pollution, or about the problems farmers are facing all over the world, and then have a behaviorally informed strategy that, that helped. The word behaviorally informed doesn't make policymakers jump for joy, makes me and maybe Mary jump for joy, but policymakers all over the world think uh, helping agriculture is a really good thing. I'll mention, I won't mention the official, but I had dinner not terribly long ago with the president of a very poor nation, just a one-on-one -on -one dinner. And he wanted to have dinner because he has 17 problems and behavioral science seems promising for him. And while he's not someone who has a PhD in economics, he's really, really smart. And the sorts of things we're discussing aren't, you know, they don't involve equations. And if you're really smart, you'll get them immediately. And so he thought, we have this problem. Poverty is one. Corruption is another. Educational opportunity is a third. And so we spent a two-hour dinner talking about behavioral science in each of those three. And this is, you know, pretty dramatic. It's the leader of a country. But among people at uh, more applied levels rather than leadership levels, it's, it's exactly the same. Wow, what a, what a lucky leader to get two hours of discussion with you about these topics. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us, Kath, for what, and what one of the commenters called the goosebumpy first 20 minutes of the session. So thank you for that. Um, we do appreciate you have many other things to do, including likely some academic work and book writing in the next in a few hours. So thank you. And um, yeah, we'll continue on for the session, but looking forward to engaging with you more as we go ahead and applying behavioral science across the UN. Great honor. All best to all of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kath. Bye. Okay, so now back to our um, our panel for today. So um, give me a second here while I share my slides again. So we're fortunate to have with us um, a panelist of three individuals who, if you're a part of the international behavioral science community, I think you, you might be familiar with at least one of these people. Um, so we'll hear from uh, short presentations about their work applying behavioral science in their organizations, what it means to their organizations, and what lessons there might be for others thinking about applying behavioral science. So first we'll hear from Sabrina Artinger, who's been in the German Federal Chancellery, where she's the head of the citizen or the behavioral science and um, citizen-centered work. I, I, I might have got that wrong. Apologies, Sabrina. And then uh, Florencia Lopez Blue, who's a lead, lead economist at the Inter-American Development Bank and has been for over a decade applying behavioral science within um, the IDB. And then finally, Britt Titus, who's with us from the International Rescue Committee, where she's the lead of behavioral insights. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Sabrina. Over to you. Um, thank you, Mary. I try to share my slides with you. No, that's not the right. So thank you. Yeah, as uh, Mary just mentioned, um, I work here at the, the German Federal Chancellery um, and our work has started in 2015, also being inspired by the work of Kess Sunstein and also our colleagues in, uh, in Britain and specifically in Denmark. Um, Mary asked us to first go into a little bit of detail on how we view behavioral science and how we use it in our work. So uh, to give you a little bit of an impression, um, here's our framework. And 
In Germany, we use behavioral science more broadly for a citizen-centered policy design approach. So we use behavioral and also social sciences as a resource for uh, designing policies from uh, the perspective of citizens and very often also uh, with the direct involvement of citizens, which um, is, I think, something that is uh, being done more and more in other countries too. So we, um, next to the behavioral science toolbox, we use uh, co-creation and uh, design thinking methods in order to come up with interventions. Another uh, focus of ours is to use behavioral science interventions that are specifically um, addressed to empower people and to boost their competencies, and by this to increase the impact and effectiveness of their policy. So here on the right hand side, you see the framework that we've jointly uh, developed with our colleagues in the federal ministries, um, which uh, starts with new insights, which is Based, well, first of all, behavioral evidence, but also new insights, especially about the context and experience of people in the very situation that we are looking at. And then, as I said, we uh, typically involve people in co-creating these inventions and fitting them to their uh, specific needs in a context. And then lastly, evaluating them in the field, ideally with uh, randomized control trials, but where not possible, other forms of evaluation and impact uh, measurements are also welcome and always um, good to have. So looking at uh, the width of topics that we uh, were able to address um, with the help of behavioral science over the last eight years. We, we span uh, almost all the federal ministries here in our government, and we've uh, helped the governments on topics such as health, like uh, with vaccination rate increases or the improvement of hygiene compliance on ICUs, um, but also typical topics as consumer protection, retirement decisions, food choice. Um, and then we heavily focus on public services and the improvement uh, of public services and the reduction of administrative burdens, but also um, like uh, in increasing uptake rates uh, for special benefits. We also address the accessibility of the law for uh, our our federal ministries as well as infrastructure pro projects by identifying barriers for instance for the expansion of broadband uh, in the country and also topics that uh, might come up later like uh, uh, victim support projects where we've uh, worked together with people affected by crime or terror in order to better understand how we need to help them better in order to cope with the situation they uh, were forced to face so looking at our development um, um, it might be interesting for specifically for those who are at the very beginning of that journey, uh, on the BI journey at the moment. So we started in 2015 here as a, a small unit in the staff of policy planning in the federal chancellery, which is, um, for those who are less familiar, it's uh, the Privy Council equivalent or the White House equivalent here in Germany. So we started in the staff of policy planning by starting up and developing the framework uh, I've just shown you. We ran pilot projects with the ministries in order to prove the concept that we could actually work with behavioral science here in our government and our, under our specific circumstances. This was um, successful enough to grant us a stable, um, the installment of a stable um, unit in the federal chancery by 2018 and uh, for the next three years which is also um, parallel to the legislation term um, we were testing the scalability of our approach and we built awareness and capabilities in the federal ministries especially by um, working together with the federal ministries in a number of uh, projects that we run with them and starting 2022, we, uh, I think, would say, uh, I'd say we um, entered the phase of expanding this approach by building capabilities and also an ecosystem, so a uh, structure that is supporting uh, BI work in the federal ministries, but also in the subordinated authorities here in Germany, where a lot of the work is actually being carried out. 
And we as a team, um, by this term, are able to focus on what we call lighthouse project. So we entered a phase where um, BI is established enough to support uh, the central um, um, political initiatives of the current legislation period. So this is also very interesting period for us with a, again another steep learning curve how to fit uh, our methods and tools to a very tight frame uh, time uh, time frame of course which then also leads to ad hoc advice and um uh, and this is uh, exciting work for us also because it means a lot of more impact um, um, for the behavioral science solution if I look at the most important topics um, for the last and potentially the next years, um, I can um, highlight uh, the work on crisis response, which I think has, uh, for many of uh, the countries that uh, are gathered in this round, has been the COVID crisis, uh, of course, but also in, um, in Europe, Due to the uh, Russian war in Ukraine, we faced a number of other crises. For instance, in Germany, we uh, were dealing with a severe energy crisis over the last winter, um, and we've been involved in uh, the crisis response as well. And then the second part or the second uh, potential um, priority area is the improvement of public services, especially um, with uh, the digitization of public services. And then of course the green transition, and this is a topic I think that we all share. Um, and uh, yeah, where there is a lot of interesting and exciting work uh, to be continued. And coming to my last slide on a specific project that um, we have been running and uh, that might illustrate you the impact and the value of behavioral science work um, I would like to highlight our recent work on the energy crisis response over the last winter, where we have supported the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. So, as I just said, due to the uh, Ukrainian war on uh, the, the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, we were facing a severe energy crisis uh, uh, due to the support of the European Union and the sanctions on Russia. So specifically, gas was um, scarce, very scarce, and the German economy is heavily relying on, um, or was heavily relying on Russian gas. So uh, the challenge was to reduce uh, um, gas, specifically gas uh, usage uh, by uh, a huge amount, and um, the EU um, um, recommended a 20% um, uh, decrease of uh, gas usage. And uh, looking at um, um, behavioral science uh, tools to do so, we helped uh, the campaign in uh, choosing a worst first approach and to uh, to identify those areas where people would uh, benefit the most from um, a behavioral change in terms of reducing their gas usage. And um, this campaign was really successful over the last year. And um, it have what you see here is uh, it's very small, but it's the graph of um, the gas usage in the private sector. And um, we were supposed to stay in the green um, uh, in the green zone, which we managed to, uh, actually the uh, the recent numbers are much better. So it was uh, expected that um, gas usage fell by about 25% over the last heating period, uh, which was of course due to cost reduction. But um, since people were not aware of the fact uh, uh, that heating was the most important uh, aspect in reducing your gas usage, it was um, a very important thing uh, to make people aware of and the campaign, the behaviorally in informed campaign um, of the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action really helped to inform people so that they were actually able to reduce the gas usage accordingly and to, uh, to um, 
make a big contribution to getting us all over safely over the winter. So um, this is from my side, um, just a little, um, yeah, um, example of how behavioral science has been established as a valuable tool here in the federal chancellery over the last eight years. And I think um, I, this morning I was at a meeting um, uh, in, a, in a ministry um, where they were um, discussing their next steps on a food waste campaign and that was all about behavioral science and it was not none of our initiated projects so what we see is that the capability building approaches that we've taken are very uh, well taken up and it was very um uh, very valuable and very satisfying to see how well the federal ministries are able to to use these tools already so thank you for listening and i'm going to unshare my slides all right thank you for that nice um tour of how you got to where you are and also where you're going in the future with the capacity building that you've done already um and great you got shared the example about energy saving because um there's questions in the chat about that, but we can get to that later. Um, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, next, now over to Florencia from the IDC. Great, thanks, over to you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Thanks for the invitation. Um, let me start uh, by saying that uh, the Inter-American Development Bank is the largest institution, financial institution for Latin America. It has a multi-billion dollar lending portfolio for the 26 um, beneficiary countries uh, for a bit of context and we have been applying behavioral insights for the last more than decade about 15 years in issues related to savings education taxation fiscal and social issues pretty much supporting governments to um, design policies with a more realistic view of um, human behavior in my next slide i show um an approach that is very similar what to Sabrina was mentioning for the German government, that is the mission is using behavioral insights to improve welfare, human capital, and all the things that Cass and Sting was mentioning. The objectives of our particular group is to generate evidence on cost-effective solutions based on our clients, our, the government demand, and support very closely. So staff and governments in acquiring these skills. I, I love also the example of Sabrina, because the capacity building we do, which is via online courses, MOOCs, presentially, but also by implementing projects hand in hand is what in the end uh, ensures the sustainability of, of, of this approach. And we have a structure that has a coordination at the research department, sectoral focal points, and visiting scholars and project team leaders in the countries and in Washington, DC. Um, in this, I wanted to just very briefly mention our academic arm. Uh, La CIA is the Latin American Economic Association, is the largest economic association, econo economists association after the American Economic Association. And at the IDB, we co-founded the this brain, which is the Behavioral Insights Network. And we have been holding annual conferences where we bring together economists from Latin America to share their work. So I think this is a nice exchange of ideas and how people are thinking about this. We have many submissions and, and papers and the next year the hosting is going to be um, by in Bogota. So we are bringing this uh, La Cia Brain Networks to the region. Yeah, the next slide is a little bit what where and um, what have we have been working on so today we have more than 70 projects this is just a selection in this map to show you that we are covering pretty much every country in latin america another thing that i wanted to mention is that we are embedding an impact evaluation in most of our projects so that we can learn whether they work or not so you can see that, say, in Mexico, we are increasing retirement savings for low-income people, or in Uruguay, where we have a lot of projects, and now you will understand in a second why, or in Argentina, we are trying to increase attendance in preschool, sending nudges to parents, or boosting the inclusion of Afro-descendants, um, as well as nudging to increase the uptake, for instance, of preventing uterine cancer screening. Um, and now I want to illustrate 
this work uh, that we have been doing in the region with very diverse topics. In the next slide, you will have a map. These topics are uh, probably a little bit outdated, but we are we're doing a lot of work on climate change, education, taxation, health, crime, gender, pretty much in every topic where the IDB is having a loan or a technical cooperation. And um, we are expanding to, to more and more topics. We have a lot of work done on COVID and, and Mary knows because we were part of, a, of an interdisciplinary uh, group. And now I go to, to one example that we really like uh, at the IDB because there's a big problem in Latin America, which is that uh, Latin America has very poor performance in PISA scores, which are the scores from the education system, and there are wide, very wide socioeconomic status gap. And we know that teacher quality is what is behind uh, what could improve uh, PISA scores is one of the main determinants, but good teachers usually chose not to go to those schools that need them the most, but they chose to go to good schools or closer schools to their, where they live. So this intervention we did in Rio with the Secretary of Education in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we implemented a very simple introspection exercise that was done at the right moment, just when the teachers had to choose to which school they wanted to go. So that, in a way, we were priming the intrinsic motivation to match the best teachers with the hard to staff schools. So what in that moment, the moment right before choosing, the only exercise was writing in a piece of paper, as you see in the screen, why did you decide to become a teacher? Because teachers want to change lives, but they might forget it at the time of the election of a school. And, and they choose, as I said, a closer school to where they live or a more convenient school. So priming this exercise of intrinsic motivation bringing we bring it to the fore with um, this priming exercise. And this super simple exercise caused that at least some of those teachers did choose to go to those schools that needed them the most. And we have um, done this exercise in Peru, in Ecuador, in, in many other countries in, in Latin America. Um, to close, uh, I wanted to say that we are also supporting two uh, initiatives of Nacho Youth Needs in the Region that are the first. Uh, I, I wish those new units in, in 10 years will be presenting something like Sabrina presented about the German Nacho unit. The first was in 2017 with the presidency unit in Uruguay. They launched um, their Nacho unit, and that's the, the newspaper article on the left, a picture, and they finance about 25, 30 projects, many related to energy savings as well, that went very well, but also to the use of uh, non-prescribed medicines, a really, a really big uh, um, initiative that unfortunately didn't continue with the, with the New York government in Uruguay, but it was very, very successful. And I'm sure it has yet, even if it's not continuing the natural unit itself, it has informed uh, also, as Sabrina said, because of that capacity building at the onset, most of the ministry's um, initiatives today. So Uruguay is today a country that is really using behavioral insights in many of their, of their policies. The second is newer, um, and it started with a support to a foundation, the, the Fundación Ineco that is on the picture, but it followed with the current Argentinian government started in 2020 with the COVID pandemic. So it was a big challenge for this unit to come to the fore. It's headed by a very talented um, person, Ivan Budasi. He has been leading this effort together with the support from the IDB and um, in the launch, I think Mary, Mary, you were there as well. Uh, they have been also bringing these policies to many ministries. They have about 25 projects. Um, this is an overview, very quick overview of what the Inter-American Development Bank has been doing in terms of using behavioral insights. Um, in my next slide, you have the QR code if you want to check. We have a website, idb.org slash behavioral. You will have a description of every one of our uh, initiatives. Thank you very much.
Great, thanks for that, Florencia. Lots to share in the region from academics to projects through to the governments. Lots, lots to explore for those starting out. Um, thank you. And if you have any links to the chat, you can put them in the chat as well to the website. That might be helpful for people who didn't get the QR code. Great, yes, on to Britt from the IRC. Mary, can you see my screen? Yes, can see it perfectly. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, my name is Britt Titus and I lead the behavioral science team at the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. Um, and my background is at the intersection of behavioral science and humanitarian action. I actually spent the first half of my career working within the UN at the World Food Program. And the second half of my career has been in applied behavioral science, working at organizations like the IRC. So you can only imagine my joy and excitement to see how much investment there is and excitement there is within the UN um, about behavioral science and so many people here today interested in, in engaging on this. So um, as a quick uh, overview, for those of you who aren't familiar with the IRC, um, the IRC works in about 40 countries supporting millions of people affected by crisis, conflict, and displacement. Um, the IRC has been using behavioral science in its projects since about 2017, um, is one of the first um, kind of uh, behavioral insights teams in the, in the humanitarian field, and uh, the organization seeks to integrate behavioral science throughout all of our work. Um, so as many of you know, um, you know, there are over 100 million uh, forcibly displaced people in the world today, and that number is only growing. Um, and so among many other important approaches that exist, um, we think that behavioral science can help um, this growing need with kind of cost effective, impactful, uh, innovative solutions. Um, so just to give you a flavor of the type of work that we do, some of the questions that our behavioral science team deals with on a daily basis are things like, as refugee crises and conflicts grow, how can we avoid disruptions in education of young people around the world? Or how do we identify malnourished children who live in some of the most remote crisis affected places on earth? So we have now conducted about 25, I think maybe more, but that's the, the number I could quickly count, um, about 25 behavioral science projects across 15 countries around the world. Um, and through these projects, we are really applying behavioral science to areas and contexts that we haven't really applied behavioral science to before, um, such as Northeast Syria, uh, where we're about to run a behavioral um, experiment um, in about a month from now. Um, and behavioral science is already having an impact in many of these contexts that you can see that I've got up on the screen. So for example, in Uganda, a behavioral science informed counseling program for couples was delivered through faith leaders um, and it decreased the frequency of physical violence by partners by more than 25% um, at only $14 per couple, which is about less than half um, of similar interventions that aimed to do the same thing. Um, another recent project we have in Jordan that aims to improve help seeking for mental health services. Um, we found that a, face, a behavioral science informed Facebook campaign reached about 400,000 people in about 10 days, um, and it led to a 14% increase in people seeking out mental health information and services online. Um, so these are just, this is just a snapshot of some of our projects. Um, but, you know, as you can imagine, the same behavioral science approach that we use in the global north in places like the US and the UK, uh, we cannot use in contexts like these. Um, and it's, we don't think of it just as a challenge, uh, which it is, of course, but we think it's also an opportunity to contextualize the behavioral science evidence, to innovate um, and, and make a behavioral science um, that's more kind of adapted to, to places that have not been traditionally represented in the literature. Um, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And we definitely believe that when it comes to our work. So for those of you who are familiar or a little familiar with behavioral science, you might recognize this kind of um, this very oversimplified uh, kind of approach to behavioral science. So typically with behavioral science projects, we might start by defining the problem. What is it we're trying to solve? We might look at what are the target behaviors? What are the behaviors that we need to change in order to achieve that um, outcome? Um, we then might look to the behavioral science evidence base to learn what has worked at kind of shifting behaviors and leading to those positive outcomes in other in other contexts um, before kind of designing um, and running a behavioral experiment or some other rigorous form of evaluation to learn what works and what doesn't. Um, however, 
uh, while this works very well, um, in many contexts, we have found in our approach that we need to add a few things um, and make some adaptations so that it works for contexts like uh, Northeast Syria or Yemen. Um, so the fact that we are addressing these kind of complex, what some people call wicked problems, means that we get brought on, our behavioral science team gets brought on to projects when IRC is just defining what, what the problem is at all. Um, so we might be brought in at the stage of, you know, how can we reduce gender-based violence in Uganda? Or how can we reduce malnutrition in children in Mali? So often this means there's not just one actor's behavior that we're trying to change or focus on, but we have to look at the entire system in which this is happening. And it's often a very complex system with many moving parts in a fragile context like the ones that we work in. Um, so this uh, type of context and this type of challenge really lends itself well to combining behavioral science with approaches like design thinking and systems thinking. Secondly, as you can imagine, there are not a lot of behavioral solutions in the literature in places like South South Sudan or Yemen, um, let alone interventions that focus on issues like childhood malnutrition in Mali. So our teams uh, need to spend a lot of time putting the human, the communities that we're working with at the very center of all we do. And this means that we spend quite a bit of time upfront, really trying to understand the context in which the communities are living and their needs, their desires, and what their goals are for, for their lives. Um, so this involves working very closely with our IRC country colleagues, as well as communities. Um, and once we do have solutions in mind from behavioral science, we really need to iteratively test those solutions with populations, with communities, even co-designing them so that we're combining the best of the behavioral science evidence with real insights and the lived experiences of the people who are going to be receiving these interventions, who are the experts on what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, so with this, we add in quite a bit of formative research at the beginning, exploring our clients lived uh, lives and realities, um, as well as contextualizing and prototyping our solutions together with communities. So I wanna talk through quickly a uh, case study of that shows the importance, I think, of these approaches. So one of IRC's focuses is trying to improve the social and emotional learning skills of children in humanitarian contexts, such as helping children with emotional regulation or conflict resolution. So this was the aim of a 2021 project in Northeast Nigeria, um, where you know, communities have been experiencing more than a decade long conflict. And the teaching of social emotional learning skills have shown a lot of success in places like the United States. Um, uh, but when we have tried to apply these same programs in places like Northeast Nigeria and Lebanon, we found almost no results at all and found that you know, teachers are often not using these activities in their classrooms whatsoever. Um, so this was at first a little confusing, but then our hypotheses were that one, these activities are probably very unfamiliar and strange to teachers in Northeast Nigeria because they're based on US you know, values and culture. And secondly, they're very difficult to implement in classrooms in places like Northeast Nigeria where teachers are overwhelmed experiencing the effects of conflict and trauma themselves and often managing classrooms of over 200 students. So to improve our, our program, um, we relied on behavioral science as well as other uh, kind of disciplines like uh, user-centered design and systems thinking, um, working very closely with teachers in Northeast Nigeria as well as local government and in-country colleagues. Um, so just to give an example, a behavioral science evidence review found that among other interventions, SMS messages might work really well um, at encouraging teachers to use more of these um, approaches in their classroom. Um, so when we went to test these SMS messages um, over the course of a few weeks, we asked teachers how this was going. And when we asked them about it, we found that they had spent the nights writing out by hand the SMS messages onto paper. And they told us that this was because that they really appreciated the SMS messages. They said that teachers in Northeast Nigeria need to have physical paper and books in front of them when they stand in front of a classroom, that that's absolutely critical for their identity as a teacher is to have that reference material in paper in front of them. Um, so further uh, kind of exploratory work like that showed us how, the importance of making sure that we rooted everything that we were doing in local context, testing things and testing things again. Um, and we found that the more local content framing insights that we incorporated into our activities, the better uptake we saw, the more we saw teachers using these activities in the classroom. Um, so by the end of it, the solution um, was not only entirely contextualized, including both local framing values, 
images depict, depicting people's lived realities in Nigerian classrooms, but a set of uh, locally tested behavioral interventions. Uh, we, we ran a, a pilot study with um, almost 300 teachers and found that teachers are now using the activities about 19 minutes a day. Most of them are using them correctly. Um, and so we're seeing really, really positive results, which is very exciting. Um, and the local government in Northeast Nigeria was not only excited about the outcome that, they, that we found, but they were also sharing that this was one of the only education projects that they had seen recently that they actually saw themselves and the teachers in their community reflected in the program and the program design. Um, so we believe that projects like these in these types of complex uh, environments in low and middle income countries um, really benefit from using this interdisciplinary iterative and systems uh, focused approach when we're using behavioral science to improve these outcomes. So thank you so much for your time. Please email me if you have any questions. Um, we actually have a group of organizations who are specifically getting together every once in a while to think about how we can apply behavioral science better in these types of contexts. So please reach out if you're interested. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for that, Brent. It's an important area of behavioral science application um, in humanitarian context in particular. Okay, so we're getting close to time, but I see there, there are a ton of questions in the Q&A box. So if we can go over a few minutes, I might just ask each of you a few questions from the Q&A so we can get to some of them. Um, so maybe I'll start with Sabrina. If everyone wants to turn their cameras back on again, they can have a bit of a discussion. And feel free to comment uh, amongst yourselves too if you, uh, if you kind of hear um, something that someone else has said. So Sabrina, there are some questions about, you mentioned the pilot projects you, you ran. How did you choose these pilot projects? And then also, what's one of the biggest challenges you faced on your journey and how did you overcome it? Bit of a general question, but what would you say to those? So, um, well, the pilot project, that was in the, our very first term starting here. And actually, um, there had been a process beforehand um, and we had some uh, prominent support from our colleagues uh, in Britain who were visiting the German government to give an idea of how behavioral science can actually be applied to, um, to various contexts. And after that, the federal ministries were um, asked to give a list of topics they would love to collaborate on. And this was a list that we, as incoming scientists, so we all came from academia and, and, um, and the industry as well, um, that we actually evaluated in terms of, uh, can you work on these topics? Is the data good enough? Can you actually um, address them with uh, um, behavioral science evidence? And that was the starting point. And the second term, it was a, um, a, a two-way process, basically. And now entering the third stage, it is uh, more an issue where we say, well, we um, focus on those um, projects that uh, deem to be most important uh, to be supported because it, behavioral science is being used in all the federal ministries already. So we are supporting those very special um, interest areas at the moment. Great, thanks. And do you have a biggest challenge or one challenge maybe you want to identify? Um, I think a big challenge is to convince people who have not been working with behavioral science about the importance, especially if impacts are not measured uh, as we want to, to do, well, if, if, um, uh, as currently done in behavioral science uh, projects. And so um, also bringing up the uh, aspect of evaluation might be uncomfortable for many of the colleagues in the federal ministry. So that is a part uh, that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. And I think uh, what, what helps against this challenge is uh, to show and also let them have um, the, uh, the freedom to um, to choose the way they want to publish these results to use them in the end once they have agreed they will we we have not had one single um study where they didn't uh, want to use the results and to publicly speak about their achievements so i think once you get them on board it's it becomes much easier but at first it might be challenging mm -hmm. because people might not be feeling so um comfortable in being evaluated <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I can definitely hear it. The momentum definitely changes things. We had a session earlier this week on UN entities embedding behavioral science into their work, and it was 
very similar discussions about how do you get the original buy-in and then once you get things moving how things can change so interesting to see the parallels again in the German government thank you for that um okay so Florencia there are quite a few questions for you I see you've answered a few already but there were a few related to teachers more specifically in your work there um so I think you, you may have started reading them but there's one about how can you ensure um you can bridge the gap between an environment that good teachers for teachers to actually do their job well and then also one about how did you know you had the right moment to interact with the teacher how did you figure what what tools maybe your methods did you use to figure that out so yeah maybe yes, some clarity great, there great questions and i yeah I, I try to answer in online but these two are, are more i need to tell the story yeah. um so at the right moment that's very nice in some countries in latin america there is something I'm going to say the, the, the Spanish word is called concurso. It's like the, the selection exam or certification. Mm -hmm. So okay. they have to all go to a place, to a building, maybe the Ministry of Education or whatever, and do the, the exam. And so with that exam, they will be ranked on how good they are. So that's where after that exam, mm -hmm. we okay. gave them the little paper, why did you want to become a teacher? So at the same exact time, the, the Secretary of Education, this, this is a Rio example, they mm -hmm. will have their levels of how good they are, but also they will have to choose which school to go. Mm, okay. In every context, of course, it's going to be different. Um, and then the other question on how do you ensure good environments, because of course, um, in, in Latin America, there are many shanty towns, and that's it's not probably the best that might, might not be public transport, it might be difficult to go, it might be violent, all of that. We know all of that and, 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 and the public sector might want to do more investments and, and, and ensure that these, these environments are better for those teachers. But here, what we wanted really to move the needle was on the intrinsic motivation. And this is the behavior insights beauty. It was not about money, it was this very cheap, actually free, um, intervention to to say okay well teachers want to make a difference so let's try to bring this to the fore in independently of all these structural reforms that of course need to be done as Ayush mentions thank you great thank you Florencia there's a lot we could talk about on that specific topic um overall okay so now Brett over to you there are quite a few questions I'll try to just choose a few um so so there's one that's I guess relatively highly ranked so it's Humanitarian settings, settings, as you mentioned, aren't usually places where people are happy to experiment with new approaches. So how did you convince your organization, the IRC, so maybe a similar question, kind of pulling on the theme that um, Sabrina mentioned, how did you, what was it like in the IRC, because it's not an, an organic place for this necessarily to start out, um, and then have you collaborated with any UN entities, and if, if not, why not, and please join us, but maybe just I'll, I'll leave you with those two questions. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, you're absolutely right. Humanitarian settings are not places where people are as open to experimenting. So I think that's just something that we've we've had to to look at. So I think first and foremost, the way that the BI, the behavioral science team in IRC was set up was under our research and innovation team. So IRC as an organization is very dedicated to research and innovation in humanitarian settings and is one of the leaders in terms of new research and, and papers and evidence-backed program. Um, programming and making decisions. So uh, the, the organization started by creating this research and innovation department. And so through that came these different types of innovation and research, um, such as strategy and yeah, more academic uh, approaches and then behavioral science. Um, so I think we we were able to kind of come in through that. And because the organization is, is really dedicated to using more research and innovation in its work. Um, and then secondly, I would say that we do not apply behavioral science in, for example, rapid onset emergencies um, for a whole host of reasons that I think you can imagine. Um, but you know, the projects that I'm talking about are typically in you know long-term refugee contexts, um, displacement settings, um, uh, protracted crises, etc. And I think it just comes back to what uh, Cass was saying: is that you know people just you know have a problem and they want to see that something works. And so you know the good thing about behavioral science is that we we do have these kind of we can have these quick wins right and we can show maybe in some in some areas that are less controversial we can show that we're having an impact and actually leading to change and leading to shifts in areas that maybe the organization has not been able to solve for yet and then using that momentum to continue kind of building buy-in throughout the organization but it is an ongoing um uh kind of 
challenge that we have and we are seeing it, it paying off, uh, which is great, but definitely not, not easy and doesn't happen overnight. And the question on UN uh, entities, um, we, I mean, I think that we, we haven't, or IRC as an organization does, you know, work very closely with UN entities. Um, we haven't had a partnership on a behavioral science project specifically, I think, with a UN entity um, yet, but we would be very, very excited to do that. So um, yes, we're, we're very open and excited for that. Um, so please do, do be in touch. Right. So on that note, I think it goes for all of our panelists too. There's lots of opportunities for collaboration with the UN, learning lessons from Germany after all these years and IDB, obviously, I mean, IDB interacts with the UN quite a bit too, but there's always more space for collaboration as well. So, um, so thank you very much for all of you joining us today in our, in our quick tour of all of your, your experiences and hearing from Cass as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll have the recording up on the YouTube playlist for those of you who want to access it and share it with colleagues. And this is really nice. Um, as I said, this came from discussions we had with colleagues in the UN who wanted to really showcase the breadth and depth of what's out there. I think we, we definitely achieved that in today's session. So thank you very much for everyone joining us and looking forward to seeing you maybe later this week, if not shortly on UN collaborations. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>